All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Really glad everyone could make it today to the points of interest, conceptual model, standard overview, and question and answer session. I'm Micah Brackman. I'm the community manager for standards at the OGC. And really what we want to do here is just provide an overview of the standard and give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. So I um, want to thank everybody who commented on the standard when it was out for comment. Really appreciate that. And the format for this session is we're going to have one hour. Uh, we're going to start the presentations off with Howard Tricky from Google. And what I would ask is that uh, if you have any questions, since we're a small group here, uh, just go ahead and jump in, right? We're a pretty small group, so I don't think there's going to be an issue with too many questions overwhelming our presenters. So jump in with questions. Um, really open discussion debate is one of our goals at the OGC and one of the best things about the OGC, I think. So I will make the recording of the session available after the webinar. How we do that is kind of up to the chairs. We could put it on the portal like we usually do. We could also put it out on our public website if we want to do that too. Uh, we do have the ability now to embed videos in our public website. So that's an option as well, but we will make sure that the recording gets shared out in one way or the other. I've shared a link to the standard in the chat window for those of you who want to take another look and follow along. Uh, any questions before we get started? All right, none heard. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Howard. Please take it away, Howard. Okay, so just checking everyone can see the POI implementers perspective slide that I'm presenting? Yep, we sure can. We're seeing, uh, we're not seeing the slide view right now. We're kind of seeing your PowerPoint window, but uh, either way is fine with me. I'm not picky about things like that. Uh, oh, well, I, I put it in slide view locally, but I guess that doesn't work. All right. It, um, it totally fine. Go ahead, take it away. Yeah, so I'm Howard Tricky, as Mika said, and I am an engineering manager at Google where I lead the teams that are responsible for our POI quality. So I'm very interested in how do we interchange POI information among different companies and people. And that's why I've been contributing to this POI standard. So what I'm going to talk about in my part of this talk is why do we want a POI standard? And in particular, what is a POI and what are some use cases for POIs? And then secondly, you know, a practical uh, explanation of some example of how we actually use our standard to represent POIs. So Howard, just quickly to interrupt, did you advance beyond the first slide already? I did. I okay. did. So I guess, I guess it's not working. I will yeah, um, maybe, maybe, I'll oh, there go to the slide view and just and, and click on that. That works fine. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, so the first part is what is a POI? A POI is a point of interest. Uh, and if you look at the Wikipedia definition of that, it says a specific point location that someone might find useful or interesting. And uh, I will note that the restriction to a point in that definition is something that we haven't stuck to. It could be a larger region than that, a ge or a line, or even a region. So uh, other than that, the idea that it is a point that someone might find useful in their application is, is what we're talking about here. Uh, and I just have some examples on the right hand side, uh, you know, a really important landmark like the Eiffel Tower or, you know, a local restaurant called Bistro Mes Amis or a, a fairly large area like Snowdonia National Park or even a thing that moves around like a food truck. Um, it, it could be just a fixture in the world like a public drinking fountain or something of specific interest only to very specific people like the telephone company which is where are the telephone poles and uh, you know we're not even saying it couldn't be something huge like a country like the netherlands okay now some use cases for pois you know the the a very common use case is people want to see poi information about things around them so they can choose which ones to go to or use so uh, very often people would want to find a restaurant near them and you need to get information about uh, you know where it is what the phone number is maybe their menu a lot of things like that uh, another common thing these days is where are electrical vehicle charging stations and 
there's a lot of specific information you need about those about you know what kind of charger plugs do they have things like that even you know what is the real time availability uh, there's the in indoor navigation use case uh, where sometimes you just use the POIs as a way to navigate around, say, an indoor mall, like go, go by the Starbucks and then turn right, things like that. Uh, another use case that, that we talked about in our group is a military use case where uh, you use POIs to simplify data collection uh, that, that holds the data needed for something mission specific. And then kind of an overall, you know, overarching thing is POI publication. That is, there are different people who have, or companies or organizations that have information about POIs. They would like to publish them so that other people can consume them and use them and having a, uh, so that, that is a, a final use case. Of course, there are many more that we talked about, but these are some representative examples. So why do we want a standard? Uh, you know, if you look at the Wikipedia POI page again, about halfway down it, they say there are 11 different file formats, and a lack of standards in this area is the reason there seem to be so many. So yeah, we need a standard. Uh, the the problem that you know everybody who's tried to make a standard on this has run into is that there are so many different use cases, and you, you can see from that example list I gave previously. They all have different attributes that you might want to have that are very specific to those use cases. So it's difficult to you know, do the universal standard that standardizes all of them. Uh, I will say, personally, as an implementer in Google, my dream is a standard that many governments, businesses, and individuals will use to publish POI information if they want to make it freely available so that we can consume it. Um, and is also flexible enough to handle most current and future use cases. All right. So then now we come to the how. Why does, how does this, our standard model, the, the conceptual standard that we're talking about today, model a POI? Uh, so the basic structure is that it is based on other OGC standards. Uh, and in particular, many of them talk about features. And so rather than reinvent features, uh, we build on top of a feature. A feature has things like basic information, like a name and some geometry and a lifetime. But when it comes down to attributes, it's kind of more specialized than that. Uh, our standard currently puts them in a payload object with a user specified schema. So you can see an example on the right. There's a feature and its name is known. It's the new church in, in Delft. Um, and its coordinates are known, but the rest of the information about that uh, are deferred to this has payload structure. Uh, the structure itself is modeled in UML, and we anticipate that based on that, you can use various implementation technologies to concretize the representation. So for instance, JSON or XML, the examples in my talk are all JSON. So in the payload, we want to be able to say, you know, what, how should you interpret this payload since it is, you know, something that is per use case, a kind of uh, flexibility. And the way we do that is there is a property which is a link to the schema that you're going to use. So this schema, this is just a made up thing on the right, uh, could be uh, something like a, a JSON schema in, in the format that they have that will explain at least the syntax of what we expect in a, in a payload. And then the semantics uh, can be specified using a different, a different link. Uh, but that's the way there is some way to, for users to interpret what is the payload going to look like. Uh, so here's, here's an example. Sorry, I missed one. No, no, I didn't. OK, so here's an example of some of the attributes you might want to put in a payload. Uh, a common set of attributes that all the POIs deal with, that I deal with, have our website and telephone number and address. And uh, there are other OGC standards that specify what the modeling for these things should look like. And so we have suggested that you borrow those if you want to put these into your payload. So here's an example of 
again, the new church, its telephone number and its address it, using those standards from other POI, other OG things. Has somebody got a question? No, okay. Uh, there are other attributes that are, are not present in other OGC standards that we could find. Um, for instance, opening hours and categories. Well, category is present in the indoor standard, but it is not very fleshed out. Uh, looking around for a standardized uh, way to represent opening hours and categories, we did not come up with the perfect already standardized uh, modeling for those. And so a recommendation that we have right now is a choice among several imperfect standards and a, an indicator to say which standard was used. So for instance, here we have said, use the, the list that OGC Indoor has specified. And uh, using that format, uh, there's a category called church. Uh, some of our uses have, have required other information that is a little less common, but for instance, something called an access point, which is where is the, say, door of this place? Where would you go if you wanted to see the door? Which may not be the same thing as the, the point geometry, which might be, say, in the center of the building. So you can specify that too. Um, and that is it. That is the, uh, the end of, of my particular part of the talk. Uh, you can ask any questions now, or maybe you want to wait until after Chuck and Stingo to sort of get the more um, full view of what we're talking about. I, I think we can take a quick pause and actually see if there's any questions for you, Howard. I think it's useful to break it up in distinct pieces here, just so people remember their questions. Um, any questions out there? And thanks, Howard, by the way. Good talk. Cheers. Give you the community manager a round of applause here. Um, yeah. Any questions out there from folks online? I've, I've got a comment. It's Chris Little uh, yeah. rather than a question. Uh, it's about opening hours. Um, yes. Because I, I chair the Temple Dwig, and opening hours is a problem because of um, daylight saving time, uh, local zone, local trap time. Um, which is kind of not really addressed by UTC, um, or is, but rather in a messy way. Yes. Um, but um, we think ISO will get around to doing something about it. But in the meantime, IETF has a request for comment out for a format for storing the details of local time zones and, um, and daylight saving hours. And you could see that would hit the streets in a, a year or two, and that may be a useful way of doing things. Because the the guidance of given to people in the past about time is, if you're going to stick a timestamp on something that is relatively persistent, please use UTC. Please use the Z time zone uh, because it's persistent and time time zones themselves and daylight saving time, etc. They're all um prone to being changed by local legislation you know they're, yeah. they're not persistent and therefore they should really be uh, a function of the client um or the client application as it were uh whereas the back end the server side you just stick to utc um and that's the only advice i could give but you could see a way of um for the clients to be able to get hold of oh by the way i'm in this local area uh this jurisdiction and therefore, the time zones are this. So it's yeah. not a solution today, but it may be next year. That, that's great to hear, and thanks for that information, Chris. I will, you know, since you mentioned the opening hours, I'll just give another minute or two on what we found when we were investigating mm -hmm. them. The there are several standards that are sort of there, but not perfect. One of them is a the calendar availability scan standard, which has a lot of flexibility in specifying, you know, what time zone you're using, not just UTC, but whatever the local time zone is. Uh, it is a, a fairly complicated and unreadable uh, representation of business hours, although it, it probably works. Yep. It has a lot of the things that I need, which is, you know, the ability to represent our holidays or things that repeat at a cadence other than weekly uh, with exceptions yeah. that that alternate so it kind of does everything it's just 
it's just a kind of hold your nose and use it standard at this point. Yep. Then okay. there's other much more simple standards that don't say anything about time zone in them at all. And in practice, that mostly works for POIs because the way people want you to interpret their business hours is whatever the the time zone and daylight saving time status is of the place where the POI is, that's what yep. these hours mean. And as the you know, as you change yep. from daylight savings time to not, you actually want the hours to, you know, to be the same numbers, but you know, mm -hmm. in the new in the new time zone that shifted yeah. it. So yeah. it mostly they works. May, yeah. A little thing to be aware of though, in the ITF proposal I've seen is they've taken the definition of what local time is, uh, which is not quite the same as the definition that ISO have taken in the definition of UTC. Um, ISO have taken, uh, said there is something called local time. If you don't specify the time zone and you don't specify Z, it is local time, but they haven't specified what local time is. And ITF has taken the hard light, uh, harder line that says it's the local legislative jurisdiction time zone but of course mm -hmm. that sort of rules out solar time <laughs> or uh other community times uh, so for example i'm assume you i'm fairly sure you'll have assumed a week is seven days yes yeah okay some places it isn't seven days mm -hmm. uh in the yoruba culture in west africa in nigeria uh, a week is either four days or eight. Uh, well, because they say it's being standardized better by the <laughs> by the ATF. And yeah, others. but there's quite a lot of places that have markets every eight days. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's their market week, as it were. Um, so yeah, so um, so there, there are a lot of little gotchas and things, and uh, weeks is one of them. <laughs> All right, Chris, thanks a lot. Just in the interest of time, I just want to keep moving forward so we make sure that everybody else gets a chance to do their presentation. But uh, yeah, really great, really great and interesting comment on that one. Uh, certainly, Howard, great to hear about the other kind of standards that are out there and kind of some of the limitations as well. Um, great, let's move on with uh, Chuck. I believe you're up next. I'm gonna go ahead and make you- to Give me the screen. Okay. Yeah, let's see. There you go. You are now the presenter, Chuck, and you should be able to share your screen. Uh, all right. So why will it not allow me to share PowerPoint? All right. I'm going to share the screen. Now we're going to we do... see it. We see it. Now we're going to do that. There we go. That works. Perfect. Every now and then it works. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so I'm Chuck Hazel. I'm uh, I'm supporting the POI SWIG. Uh, background is in uh, system and uh, enterprise architecture. So, uh, main goal here is to uh, make sure the POI standard uh, integrates cleanly with all the other. Uh, OTC and ISO standards we're dealing with. The um, let me uh, no, I don't want to do that. I'm trying to get some real estate here. So the uh, how about this? Now, what's annoying is that it's sitting right in the middle of my screen. Uh, the OTC point. <clears throat> so basically, the uh, point of interest conceptual model is a uh, model for representing information about POIs. And um, we talked about what a POI was, I'm not going to go over that again. But uh, from the architectural point of view, the data architecture point of view, a POI is a feature that provides a representation of a feature of interest. That is another feature. So basically, we assume that a POI is sitting on top of some sort of uh, data repository that somewhere you have a detailed description of what that POI is, but you want, don't want to make that entire detailed description available to the end user. You want to just give them just a little, uh, almost an abstract of what that feature is. So the P POI is that abstract, is that feature, and the uh, what it is an abstract of is a much more complex 
feature of interest, which you may or may not have direct access to. But the bottom line is everything is both the POI and what's describing are both OGC features. The conceptual standard defines a platform independent data model. Now, platform independent data model is a data model that is explicitly agnostic to the implementing technology. Uh, we've kind of gotten away from that over the past uh, couple of decades because everything was uh, web services and XML. And then when Jason came along, there was a lot of headache. So we're trying to get back to the conceptual model uh, approach where you model, basically all of the design is in the conceptual model in the platform independent model. And then the implementation details specific to a particular technology, be it JSON, uh, XML, protocol buffs, whatever, are derived from that platform independent model. The conceptual model defines the standard properties for all POIs, and that's a scope that kind of bites us uh, as we go forward. We do not impose any requirements on the data that is represented. I'm not gonna tell you, you what your data model has to be. POI should not tell you what the data model has to be. The POI should exist to provide a summary and abstract of your data model. That's another problem we ran into later on. <clears throat> But the whole idea is that the data set owner decides what to expose and how to expose it. So the approach we used was a platform independent UML model. Um, future implementations will provide the platform specific models. We have quite a bit of experience with this. We take the UML model, we crank it through shape change, we get the XML schema out, we get the JSON schema out. We've done that quite a bit. So it's, uh, it's a non-trivial exercise, but it's one we are experienced with. We're gonna leverage the tools and techniques used in CityGML 3.0. Um, CityGML 3.0 was one of the first uh, attempts to use a platform independent model to generate this documentation for the standard. <clears throat> Reason being is that the UML model can become very complex very quickly. And to keep a document synchronized with a UML model is very painful. But if I can generate the document directly from the UML model, then I know that the document is an accurate representation of the, uh, of the model. So we, we brought some of those tools over and uh, gave them a run on uh, the POI standard. Key point is a POI is a feature. It's built on ISO 19107, which is the ISO TC211 standard for geometry. And it's built on ISO 19109, which is the uh, ISO TC211 general feature model. This is the same foundation, the same geometry, the same feature concepts that all OTC conformant data sets should be built on. If you're not built on this, then uh, you've got a little bit more work to do. But uh, the goal is to make sure the POI is consistent and easily integrated into any OGC conformant data set. And to help us do that, TC211 has a harmonized UML model, which is basically their platform independent model. And rather than invent our own feature model and our own geometry, we simply stole, I mean, uh, reused what they already had. And that's a repeated mantra here, reuse, reuse, reuse. If it already exists, don't create it. The property types we use in here, we borrowed from uh, ISO 19115, which is the ISO TC211 standard for metadata, and ISO 19103, which is the TC211 standard for basic data primitives. Um, also, we want this to be data set agnostic. I can very easily develop a POI model for a particular use case. I can develop a POI model for a particular data set. I can make assumptions about that data set. But what we found when we went through our use cases is that there was an awful lot of uh, but, but what if uh, scenarios that came up. And it became very difficult to identify a set of attributes that we, we can state as being common across all POIs. But anyway, we'll get back to that. 
Uh, from I saw one nine one zero seven and one nine one zero nine, we stole the um, we borrowed the general feature model, which we have on the left, which is a little bit complex, but not all that bad. And we borrowed the geometry, which we see on the right. And I should mention at this point that we did restrict the geometry. The geometry and actually general feature model as well can become very complex. We Restricted geometry to points, lines, and polygons, uh, since that seems to cover all the use cases we know of at this point. Uh, because we're built on the ISO model and we referenced the ISO model directly, that constraint could be relaxed if at some point we find that we need more complex geometries for POIs. Um, rather not do that, it seems to undermine or defeat the whole purpose of uh, the capabilities there. The extensions, these extensions we also borrowed from CDGML 3.0. One was the uh, concept of an abstract feature. A feature doesn't really, the basic ISO feature class doesn't give you much information about the feature. The abstract feature class added some more things like the description and identifier, a feature ID, which is different from the identifier, a name, just basically what am I type stuff. Then we added abstract feature with lifespan, and it does as more information, not just what am I, but when am I? When was I created? When am I supposed to go away? When am I valid from? When am I valid to? And fairly basic stuff. But since it's already, it's already defined in City GML 3.0, and we want to make a POI model which is applicable to any OGC based data store, <clears throat> data set. Once again, reuse improves interoperability. The root of all this is really the abstract POI. And what we ended up with was a set of, I mean, we went through a lot of use cases when we scrubbed the requirements for the POI. And we came up with some great ideas and then we turned around by the use case that invalidated all those great ideas. So we'd go back and start over again. And eventually, we determined that there really isn't anything we can put in the POI itself except for information that describes the POI. So we've got the contact information, who is responsible for this uh, POI, which is CI responsibility, which comes out of ISO 19101. I mean, 19115, I'm sorry. We have metadata, has metadata, which is a hyperlink. Uh, link, which is a uh, UML representation of XLink. Keywords, MD keywords from uh, 19115. This is, uh, <clears throat> keywords are actually done as a code list, so they consist of a URI, URI, which identifies what registry these keywords are defined in, and then the keyword name, which identifies the entry in that registry, and then the keyword value, which tells you what the value of that keyword is. So it allows you to actually scope the keywords and use keywords, keywords from multiple vocabularies and have definitions in a registry of what that keyword means. Uh, rights, MD constraints out of 19115. MD constraints covers both legal constraints as well as security constraints. Security markings, classification, licensing, it's all in there. We don't have to reinvent it, it's ready to go. Symbology, people are going to want to display this. The uh, POI owner may want to specify how you display this. So once again, it's an X-link abstraction to point to symbology. Uh, but we didn't try to uh, determine what standard to use for symbology because that is kind of out of our scope, we think. So that's basically what is in a POI. Uh, associated with a POI, is the POI payload. Now the POI payload is, as delivered, basically an empty box. It has a reference to the feature of interest, so that means given a POI payload, I can go identify the feature that in the data set that this POI describes. I have with it a at least one schema. And the reason why we have more than one is not because I want to have an XML and a JSON, but I have a case where I can have a JSON and a YAML schema 
two different schema languages describing the same data set, data model. So schema tells me how to parse, tells me the semantics of the payload. I've also got an optional link to a definition. This would be an ontology or something similar. That's if I want to provide the end user the semantics of the uh, payload. What do these different properties mean? Kind of looking forward, we don't have, we don't really have any implementations of that at this point, but we anticipate we will. So the whole idea is that there is so much variety of data in the data sets that once exposed POIs that we found standardizing the shared descriptive content was almost an impossible task, maybe an impossible task. The NP, anyway, I won't do that, that's a geek talk. Um, but we, what we wanted to do was to have the payload self-describing so that if I pull down the payload, I get with the payload enough information to extract the information that's been loaded into the payload itself. So that's the goal. The result is a fairly fairly simple standard, actually. Uh, putting it all together, we've got abstract feature. We have abstract feature with lifespan from uh, CityGML. We have a feature of interest, which is basically just a type of feature, the feature that we're describing. We've got the abstract POI. We have implementations of the abstract POI. Uh, we have the POI payload, definition, schema. That's it. So this is all fits together fairly nicely. It all maximizes reuse. We also include in the standard a whole dictionary of other potentially useful uh, data types from uh, ISO standards. We've included them for those are not normative, those are informative, but they're in there for the purpose of promoting reuse of existing data models and existing data concepts instead of reinventing a dozen different versions of the same thing. A dozen different variants would be a better way of putting it. And that is all I have. Questions? Thanks, Jeff. We've got time for maybe one question for Chuck before we move on to Stain. So any questions out there for Chuck? All right, Michael, you want to take your screen back? I sure will. And Stan, I'll make you the presenter. Oh, you're talking on mute. You can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. We can see your screen just fine. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you, Michael, for the introduction and the organization for this uh, webinar. Well, um, my name is Stan Talir. I work for the Flemish government or Digital Flandre. Uh, I've been representing them in the uh, standards working group for a while now. So, um, next screen. Okay, so why is the, the, the Flemish government interested in uh, a POI standard, you might ask? We have a long standing POI service by which we publish uh, POIs in, uh, the, in Flanders. And with that in mind, we uh, executed uh, or did a proof of concept for the OGCPY conceptual model. So a bit more background about our POI service. Um, we've been doing this for over 10 years now, and we get uh, 21 data sets sent to us, sent to us by eight government agencies. Uh, we get them sent to us in different formats. And we organize these in uh, eight teams, 70 categories, and about 154 uh, PY types. And we're steadily approaching now the 200,000 mark of uh, 100,000 PYs we publish. Uh, this 
POI service was intended to publish uh, POIs on our geo portal. That's called geopunt.de. And the next few slides just illustrate the way we uh, publish them. Obviously, we, we collect a lot of uh, attribute data for the POIs, address information, names, uh, licensing, all those stuff that uh, Howard and uh, Chuck mentioned. And this, these are shown in, in our portal. Now, um, one major issue as a data publisher or two is we get these uh, data sent to us in uh, a number of source models. Every uh, organization or government agency has its own way of collecting data and storing the data. And they send it to us in different formats, so that's uh, an issue. So as a service, we, we map those to our own uh, relational data model. We made a relational database to store uh, BOIs. So we map these, all the data we receive, and we map these into our own relational data model. Now, uh, as a publisher, there's two interests in the POI standard. Or the, one is it would be highly beneficial to get the data sent to us in a kind of standard uh, way. And the other way, uh, the other one is obviously we'd like to publish it in a standardized way. So we're, our interest in this is both ways. And with this in mind, we uh, performed a proof of concept um, for which we first created a JSON schema uh, based on our POI service and the conceptual model. We encoded the POIs using the schema and captured the issues and solved the issues we, we came up with. Now, as um, the next few slides illustrate the results of uh, that translation for one POI, um, we did this for our ent entire data set and we came, um, came up with uh, not too many issues. So, um, Howard already mentioned and, and checked it, the, the, the difference between the basic attributes and payload attributes. So, for us, basic attributes type, geometry, feature ID, name, contact info, info we could easily map from our database. Uh, we were also interested as a government in, uh, as Chuck mentioned, the metadata. Uh, as a government, we, are, uh, we take pride in um, creating metadata records for every data set we publish, so we need that one, and also we want to uh, add or make clear what the rights are and licenses that are connected to the data sets we, we publish. So we need those. And all the other attributes, we created uh, a schema for the payload. And here we have additional info, uh, online resources, uh, location info, more ad or written out address, other stuff, and an alternate name, notes, and uh, the organized or the, the hierarchy I mentioned earlier, earlier with um, types, categories, and teams. So that's my short uh, in my short presentation. The general conclusion for us as a publisher was um, it was pretty easy to convert our data model, relational data model, into some. Uh, into the OG, OGC conceptual model. And we definitely see the benefits of uh, receiving data in this format or this model and distribu distri distributing our data in this model. So that's the short one for me. Micah, I can give you the word and the screen back if you want. Great, thanks Dane, appreciate that. Short and sweet, but it's always good to see an implementation come to light. So that was very, very helpful. All right. So, um, yeah, I don't have uh, anything else to present on my end, but I am uh, certainly willing to open it up to questions here if there's any questions from the group or any other discussion points.
Anybody have any questions? You can type them in the chat too as well if you'd like. I'm not hearing any yet, so I do have a question. I'll jump in. Howard, my question is for you about that access point field. I think that's a really interesting and potentially valuable thing to add into the standard. And I'll tell you why. I was just visiting some family and they live in a gated community. And when you type the name of the community into Google Maps, it will route you to a gate that is only accessible by people who live in the community and have an access card. So they, they've actually had some issues where, for example, an ambulance will be coming to the community and will not be able to get in the gate because the actual public access point is a different address, right? So just, yeah, really, I think valuable use case for something like that access point field. I'm wondering how widely implemented in your experience that is, and also like if you can then adjust, say, a routing engine to be able to account for that, to route, for example, you know, delivery vehicles or more importantly, uh, EMS to the right point. Yeah, I don't know the details of other proprietary online map providers, but I would be surprised if they didn't all have some Where do you, where does a where is a car supposed to go to? The the reason that I had it in my example was actually a different reason, which is if you want to use POIs in a VR application, you'd like to know what do you what you know where's the camera pointing at? Where 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 is the point that you would see if you were looking at this, which is often this access point. So that's why I had a use for it in a in a demo we did in Delft uh, with VR, making a, a data set, they wanted an access point in there. Uh, but you're right, and, and your example shows that the concept of access point is actually more general than just one point. And, and you know, if you're doing a standard, and this gets to Chuck's point, there's so many different use cases that it gets hard to, to standardize them all. But you'd like the public access point, the resident access point, the walking access point, the public transportation access point. I mean, there's lots of different even types of access points when you get to it. 